Dr. Nancy Rubin, those of you who attended the EMDR breakout session, you guys already know Nancy. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of information. Um, I've been working with Nancy for more years than either of us wish to disclose. She's a professor in the University of Alabama College of Community Health Sciences. She's a clinical psychologist. She's a, okay, I'm not supposed to swear up here. She's a kick butt therapist. I've watched her, she does EMDR, she does um, all kinds of, she's amazing, she does yoga, she's just, um, she blows me away. Her introduction material is on your little sheet, which is in your folder, so I'm gonna let you read that and let her get started. I'll start by thanking Deb for that very lovely introduction. Can everybody hear me? Sounds like you can. That sounds pretty loud. One thing I'm not, and I don't usually say this as I told some people earlier, is I don't actually public speak a whole lot, but I have been doing more of that. Um, so what I'm going to do up here today is talk about the update of the, what we started last year about the Foster Care Collaborative. That's what I'm calling it. We don't actually have a name yet. We should, but um, anyway, so let's get started. So the group of people working on this is these people, uh, Deb, who is just up here, Jill Beck, from, she's been talking much of today, uh, Joy Humphreys from DHR, and Misty Creel, and, oh, David's not on here. David, too, you can raise your, raise your hands. Brian, Laura Reeves from Indian Rivers, and Mandy Fowler, also from Social Work. So back a few years ago, Deb and I have been working together for a long time in the family, I, I teach, uh, we teach together uh, behind the mirror family System, uh, systems therapy class. So we have a team behind the mirror, and so we get together almost weekly about that. And a few years ago, um, I don't know if you, and how many of you have heard of or seen Bessel van der Kolk's book, The uh, Body Keeps the Score? Many people see that? It's a fabulous book on trauma, which I don't have a picture of. Um, it came out a few years ago. He's an international expert on trauma, a psychiatrist out of Boston. And uh, he wrote this book on the body keeps the score. And it's how trauma is stored in our mind body and newer interventions and how he, he explains it really well and how he's, he is recommending some newer interventions. Anyways, I gave that to a lot of people, one of them being Deb for, for Christmas or her birthday. It got us talking about our dreams for trauma interventions. I do a lot of trauma work. At, at, I'm at University Medical Center my whole time here at the university, which is coming up to 30 years, it's been very clear to me that there's a lot of trauma, and that's what I've been doing, mostly with adults. Deb works more with children, and so we were talking about what we'd like to do and about that, and since working as a one-on-one -on -one therapist, that, that's only one resource. There's many other things that can be helpful, like yoga, like um, lots of things. So Deb and I were talking, and, and she was wanting to do an intervention, a, a, a a comprehensive intervention for university people focused on vets and students. I wanted to do that same sort of thing for the for town, the town of Tuscaloosa, the county. And then we were taught we joined with Jill Beck and her her idea was something in foster care. And Jill Beck is heads up YSI, the Youth Services Institute. So she's already skilled at program development. So we decided to start with hers. And so we decided we would think about what we wanted to do within the foster care system. And we ended up bringing this group of people together. Uh, let's see. Next page, go. Too many things. So what we did is we began dreaming. We invited others to, to join. And our early thoughts were that maybe we'd have some kind of intervention that worked with maybe five families a year. But we didn't think that was going to be the best idea or the most helpful. Well, Deb, who's really good at researching, found this book, Trauma Systems Therapy, and had us all read it. Well, I, 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 we all became excited about it, but my own experience about becoming excited about it was, as a, as a psychologist, someone who's pretty well trained in cognitive behavior therapy, family systems therapy, EMDR, trauma therapy, I was really excited by some of the um, ideas. For instance, this one story he told about us, about a young man named Jeffrey, I think is the gentleman's, the young man's uh, name in the book. 
He's in a residential treatment facility. And, and the trauma systems people are working with this residential treatment facility. And they're called up because Jeffrey has punched three different people. He's punched two staff people and one resident. And so when Glenn Sachs and his group, the people who are working with them, say, well, tell us what happens, the uh, people at the treatment facility say, well, we just told you. He punched two staff and one student. And, and what Glenn said after that is, no, let's really look at what happened. What were actually the triggers? And we, you've heard about triggers today. Um, actually, I think Stacy was talking a lot about that at lunchtime. So when they really got together, the team of the residential facility and the Glenn Sachs trauma systems therapy people, and explored what had happened, there were three, three different stories. The first one was something like, Jeffrey was at lunch and he wanted seconds. But lunchtime was over, the official lunchtime at the facility. And so when he asked for lunch, one of the staff people said, no, lunch is over, and punch in the face, which they were pretty mad at Jeffrey about. The other event was he had asked for a snack, but it wasn't snack time. And so when the staff person said no, punched him in the face. The third thing turned out, Jeffrey was in the common room watching a cooking show. And one of the other residents turned the channel. And when that happened, Jeffrey punched him in the face. Now, those aren't the exact stories from the, um, from the book, but they're close. So what is the common thread there? Food, yeah. So when they got more of the history for Jeffrey, what they found out was that Jeffrey had, of course, a very severe uh, child sexual, child physical abuse history having to do with, uh, I believe, being in a cage and food being withheld. And so food was a very big trigger for him. And what I loved about this program is the intervention is, what are Jeffrey's triggers? And the, one of the first thing is, how do we make his environment safe? And so when he's having these things that this program calls survival in the moment moments, which are the things that, are, the things that get kids in, or people in trouble, running, cutting, suicidal stuff, punching. Our job is to figure out what is going on, as he says, wherever it takes, wherever it happens, whatever it takes. Is this kid getting triggered at school? Is he getting triggered at church? Is she getting triggered um, playing basketball? Is it certain people? And so what he's developed is a um, a system of treatment working with practitioners and organizations and who's ever involved with the child to figure out first safety, then emotional regulation, as well as some other things, medication when that's needed, advocacy, if, especially if the person ends up, well, in, if it's foster, we decided to pick foster care, but there could certainly be lots of reasons there might be advocacy for, for children, certainly in foster care with guardians and placements. Uh, and it, he works with both the treatment and then the organizations that are involved with the treatment. No one organization tends to have everything that's needed. In, here in Tuscaloosa, that may be more, more real than in other places. So the organizations we pulled together so far are Indian Rivers, um, the University, Medical, uh, Medical Center and Social Work, DHR. Uh, um, and let's see, who am I missing right now? There's someone else. Brew Porch? We had Brew Porch for a while. We hope to get them again. <laughs> but, uh, we're hoping um, to have them involved too, and other people too. So anyways, we decided on um, trauma systems therapy as a potential invent in, uh, intervention. Laura came on, on board, Mandy. Um, we did extra education, watching a video, talking to Glenn Sachs' group, and then a year ago, Glenn Sachs was the uh, keynote uh, speaker here. It was a fabulous, fabulous presentation about trauma and, and how this system works. So, and see, T TST is two things. It's a clinical model that I just mentioned that specifies how to help a child and family, and it's an organization model. So we get the organizational leadership and the organizations on board to keep this going even after perhaps different practitioners uh, retire or move or other things change. This is actually a very big deal and it takes a while to get going. Um, who benefits from TST is any child with a plausible trauma history. Another thing that's cool about how he developed all of this is 
we don't have to know that the trauma, what the trauma is. We just need to know that there's a plausible likelihood that there was trauma. And honestly, anybody in the foster care system, there's trauma. So that's going to, any of our kids are going to meet that. But there are certainly symptoms and things that we're used to seeing in people with trauma that if those are there, we don't have to figure out if, if you know, they were sexually abused by their uncle or something happened to them when they were preverbal. We don't have to figure that out. The other thing is that the child has difficulty regulating emotional states, and that's the stuff that gets them into trouble, dissociation, cutting, suicidal stuff, anger outbursts, panic attacks. And we want to, we want to address the tendency to have those dramatic shifts, um, and we do that with social interventions, and that's the stuff where you work with where the kid lives, where the kid um, goes to school, where the kid goes to church and help, help that become safer. There's psychotherapy after we get them safe and regulated more in, in the environment. They learn using um, more like cognitive behavioral kinds of things, meditation, stuff like that. They learn how to regulate themselves. And also there can be psychopharmacology, meds when needed. Uh, let's see. These, let me just tell you, this is Sachs Reactus Conference. These are his slides from last year. Um, I didn't know how to do some of it myself, really, so I just borrowed them. The there are three phases of treatment. The safety focused is first. The regulation focused, that's more the individual therapy, is second. And then beyond trauma is where, how you take that into your life. One of the things we do with the, with the, with the families and the, and the kids is that you don't necessarily start at the beginning. You do an assessment and you start where it's needed. The four arms are, again, this is another way of looking at, well, a little different. There's psychiatry and psychopharm, there's legal advocacy, there's skill-based therapy, and there's home and community-based services. The TST community is, is in 16 different places at this time, 16 states in the District of Columbia. These are the places that they're, they're currently in using it. Outpatient therapy, residential treatment, foster care, refugee, juvenile justice, substance abuse, and mental health services community-based prevention and substance use and mental health. Okay, so that's where we were last year. And when we got here, here, we had had all those meetings and we had got Glenn Sachs here and we decided that we wanted to do this program. At that point, what we needed next was money because this program is actually this cool 18-month um, program where they meet with us regularly with the, with the treatment team, with the supervisor team, with the leadership team, monthly and weekly and monthly for up to two, a year and a half to two years. They come and do a two-and-a-half-day conference at the beginning. They do a two-and-a-half-day, two-day conference towards the end where they um, teach us to be the trainers as well as train any of the staff that's um, come in new. Uh, and so that's an expensive prospect. I do, one of the things I liked about the program is we do get that, what I call hand-holding. It's very hard to take a book and implement a program. So these people are going to help us. They're going to be with us in the beginning probably, well, it, it won't feel like every step of the way, which would be nice, but they will be with us at least weekly to help us with the families. Um, so we ended, up, we ended up actually getting enough money. So at, a year ago we did not have the money. Then we got state funding from DHR. We got some money from my college, the College of Community Health Sciences. We got money from the local um, Mental Health Alliance. Uh, Dr. Nelson Gardell donated some of her research overhead, and YSI has been very generous with assisting where it can, like for something like this conference. So it took a while to get the contracts. So the contracts between UA and SUNY. So we're thinking that it should be actually started in a couple of months by the end of that training. Now, our goal is 25 children in the first year. That is really exciting. It feels a little overwhelming. Um, and our target group in the foster care system at the moment is children at risk for disruption. So these are the children that, well, I don't need to explain that, <laughs> at risk for disruption. And that's who we're going to start with. So hopefully next year at this time, we'll be able to tell you how that's going, and we'll be able to say it's going really well. Um, the amount of money it takes to house these children in residential treatment, if they've been disrupted that badly, is a whole lot. And just keeping one of those children out will be way better for them, but also way better for us and the people who take care of them and for the state. Um, it's, I think it's an, an amazingly good uh, investment of money. 
So this is what we're doing now. After a year or so, um, we want to develop a second team. Right now, the team is starting in Tuscaloosa County. The second team will be probably Pickens County or maybe a second one in Tuscaloosa, but more likely a, a Pickens County team. And then we want to be adding other interested groups in, the, in and around the state. <clears throat> one of the, another cool thing about this training is that after the year and a half, we will be certified trainers. So we actually will be able to then train people in this state, train, train groups in this state and keep growing this program across wherever we think it would be helpful or where other people think it would be helpful. And that is really exciting. <coughs> Let's see. Our other goals include in continuing, continuing to increase information and awareness and uh, training around, around trauma, including this REACTS conference. Um, it, has include, it includes scholarships for students to attend today to increase access. Um, and already someone mentioned today, maybe more than once, that one of the barriers to our foster care kids here in, in Tuscaloosa is that they're not, they're not here. We want them back here, back home. So we need to get the kids back and we need to increase our foster families to do that. So our vision for the future is, after this next year when we are up and running, is to expand the TST across the state. When I met Glenn Sachs a couple, last year, one of the first things I asked him after hello and introduced myself and himself is I asked him why they weren't doing EMDR for the trauma treatment place part of the program. And he said the reason we weren't, he wasn't and we aren't, is because it hasn't been researched yet. And what he said to me was, do you want to do it? And I said, yes. So hopefully, after we uh, have implemented the program for maybe a year and a half or two and know what we're doing, we'll be able to implement an EMDR arm to start the research to use that as a second option in the program. Uh, we'd like to, well, Deb and I would like to have a co comprehensive trauma treatment centers for UA in Tuscaloosa. And I'm actually writing a book, which I had just started last year on complex trauma in adults presenting as multiple medical problems and psychiatric problems. That goes very well with trauma because that's why they're, that's why they have it. The book's tentatively called, I think it's, they think I'm crazy. That's my goal. The rest of it's really for the whole group. So, uh, any questions? Did I miss anything? Okay. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University Medical Center here on campus. He's a general pediatrician with several years of experience. He's very interested in adoption, ADHD, multiple births, and children with developmental delays, but perhaps, and, and then it goes into all his credentials, which are important, but at this moment isn't really what I want to tell you about. What I really want to tell you about is this last bit. He's active in the foster care community. His heart is with foster children, and he's really done something very exciting that he's going to update you on now. Welcome, Dr. Gannon. No, I just need to turn it on. Is it on? No, it's not on. I just can't figure out how to turn it on. Is the green light coming on? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You'd think I'd never spoken before. So, thank you for having me here. I know there probably are not a lot of other medical personnel in the building. But there is growing interest in the medical community nationwide about the special needs, special medical and mental health needs of children in foster care. So I'm really just falling into that trend and I would like to bring that to Tuscaloosa and that's one of the reasons I'm part of the TST team. But at one of our TST meetings, Joy Humphrey was sitting next to me and we were talking about how we would recruit these children into TST and she said, can we just start the clinic now? Why do we need to wait until TST gets underway? So we started. Knowing that we didn't really have the infrastructure built, it was essentially me carving out half a day of clinic. And so I can talk, I've got a little bit about 
why this is a good idea, but I think I don't really have to explain all of this. I think I've already presented it previously. You all know it just makes sense that this is a good idea because children in foster care, as we've already discussed, have a lot more mental health needs, a lot more medical needs than the general population. So having a patient-centered medical home model is obviously a good idea. It just makes sense. Um, these are some of the things that occur in more, um, with more frequency in these children. And the children on the, on the list basically have all of these, except maybe the attachment problems because they've been in the same home their whole lives. But, um, and they, we don't know if they're exposed to toxic stress. Maybe just simply being premature is toxic stress. But, you know, so it doesn't take very much to find a kid in foster care who has all these characteristics. So we started our clinic. There was this law several years ago, and in most of the country, the care, the medical care for children in foster care is still just as fragmented as it was 10 years ago. There are a few places there are probably 20 foster care clinics across the country now. There's one in Dallas and one in San Diego and one in Cincinnati. Those three are huge and very comprehensive with developmental specialists and psychiatrists that are embedded. They're wonderful programs, but those are also larger um, jurisdictions. So they have a lot more access to the children, a lot more access to providers to, to do all of that 360 degree care. We don't have as much, so we want to build this, but it's gonna take a while to get there. Luckily, the dental needs is a really big problem in other parts of the country, but here, because we have four different uh, pediatric dental practices in Tuscaloosa, we're lucky that's not really been an issue here. Most of the families, the foster parents already know which dentist they can go to, so that has not been an issue. TST is addressing the mental health part because that is obviously a big problem, we all know that. Prescription oversight is an issue. We have some things, TST will help us with that, but we have some other, um, I'm trying to develop some connections with our psychiatrists at UMC to address some of that as well. So we started the clinic two years ago. Um, one thing Deb did not mention is that I was a foster parent and have adopted, so now you know I have all these kids in my house, so I'm seeing it from that side too. But one of the reasons uh, germination of this was that when I was in Kentucky and doing foster care actively, I had people showing up in my practice. They all wanted to see me because they knew I understood what they were dealing with, all of the administrative issues and different other things. So that's really where this started, and I was surprised to come to a university setting and there was nothing like this that existed. So that was really where this started. Um, we've been involving students from the School of Social Work for a while, but it's been a little bit, um, it's been a work in progress. I don't think they have really known what was expected of them, because I didn't really know how to write that job description. And after working with this for a couple of years, I think I'm starting to realize by working with our medical social workers how they can really provide actual case management and really help as partner in a more successful way with the department and Child Protective Services. So there are a several different models. There was an uh, article just published in one of the pediatric journals about two months ago now describing the clinic experience, creating the clinic in Cincinnati. And they talked about several different models. Their model is more of a consultation clinic, which would be what I would be doing. Theirs has a little bit more to it than ours does. Some of the other clinics, like the one in San Diego, they just take over the primary care for the, for the children. So there are lots of different ways to do it. Because of our staffing issues, really the, we would like to provide more service, but it's going to be, at least for right now, more of a consultation clinic. So allowing for access, so the kids can get that initial visit within 10 days of placement, see what needs they have and make sure they get what they need. But if they want to go back to their primary care, then they certainly can do that. A lot of the families are, a lot of the foster parents are choosing to stick with me because they, they know that I understand what they're dealing with, but we're not gonna require them to do that. Um, 
part of the access issue and continuity issue is I can't always be available, and so I need the um, services of my entire practice to take care of sick visits and follow-up visits and that kind of thing. So that's sort of the way we've looked at this up until now. So this is really, these are the ideas, the tenets of a patient-centered medical home. And this is more of a medical thing, but this is really where social work and um, medicine meet because it's all about care management. There is a physician-led team, but what that means is we understand that there are a lot of other people on the team. It's not just about coming in, spending 10 minutes with your doctor. It's about having a nurse that's reviewing the chart ahead of time to be sure the physician has everything queued up that they need to look at for chronic needs. It means that you've got a case manager, which may be a social worker, who's making sure all those needs are met. You've got their mental health providers, your dentists, all of that. So the whole point is that there's a team and we go into it understanding that it's not just about the doctor. And then we want to look at the whole person and integration of all those needs. So what we looked at was, or what we've been assessing already a little bit, oops, sorry. Access, continuity, communication, and quality improvement. Our practice, UMC Pediatrics, went through something called patient Center medical home certification at the end of last year, which took me away from the foster care thing for a little while. But these were the four things that we really looked at. And in some ways we do well, in some ways we don't do as well. But part of that process was that we did a quality improvement questionnaire looking at how, um, what is the experience of the children, of the parents, the foster parents within this clinic. And we actually found they're happier with the care they're receiving than our general population. Our general population, yeah, they're okay, you know, but there are some things they don't like. Most of the people in the foster care population are actually happier. And from their answers in the questionnaires, it looks like most of that's about continuity. They know when they can get in and they know that they're going to see the same person all the time. So that gives us, of course, lessons for our general pediatric clinic, but it also tells us what direction we need to go with this clinic. Um, so that's really one of our successes, is we are able to get kids seen when they enter the system. Before this, was ex uh, before this existed, I heard a lot of foster parents complaining that even in our clinic, they would call to make an appointment, they would be told, well, you have to wait till your Medicaid card is updated and everything, which might be the beginning of the next month, and then they would call back, and then it would be two weeks before they could get a new patient appointment. And that same thing was happening all over town. The foster parents, other kids might go to a private practice in town that doesn't take Medicaid, so then they would lose time trying to make an appointment that wasn't going to get made anyway. The access thing has definitely improved. Um, I've done a lot of sort of marketing, coming to DHR. They understand this is there, so that has helped. Um, and then I'm working on, I, I think I've already now met a lot of the DHR workers, a lot of the case workers, and that is helping to create those two -way, um, that two-way communication so that they know how to reach me and, and we can have a good conversation about these kids. Um, and definitely having the paperwork done ahead of time, I've found that these visits, because every patient's a new patient, they can take a long time. And this is where the whole case management thing comes in. Over the last several months, after we looked at the continuity thing and realized the biggest um, complaint people had is the amount of time they were in the office. So we were really, I started working with the medical social workers in, at UMC about how can we improve that? Because I have these students available to me, but they don't really know what to do. They just show up when I have clinic, and then they're hearing me teach them about foster care, but they don't really know how they can help. And it, we realized that what they can help with is being sure that they're touching base with these families at the time they're scheduled. That way, before the patient and the uh, family shows up in my office, we already have all this information. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but um, the consents are a big problem, too. We often don't know, at the time of the visit, who their other where their care has been previously. Sometimes they were our patients, sometimes they weren't. We may not be able to get that before they show up in the office, but if we get the ball rolling and we know, okay, the child was born in Alabama, all the records are in Alabama, but there's nothing on the state registry for their shots. Well, that tells us they haven't had any shots. 
But if they were born somewhere else, then we know to try and get in touch with that other state and get their shot record ahead of the visit. There are little things like that that sound kind of stupid, little details, but in reality it makes everything run much more smoothly so that when the family arrives, we can make that more of a normal 20, 30 minute visit rather than wasting a lot of time on paperwork and phone calls and those sorts of things. Oops, I thought I had more slides than that. Is that it? So I thought I had another slide, but basically what I was thinking too is about the trauma-informed component of it, and that is I feel like it's important to have documented in the chart why they're in foster care, what their story is, what the, light, what the current visitation schedule and all that is. Do I need to expect that the birth parents or grandparents or somebody is going to be calling for information or maybe showing up for visits? That needs to be documented. It needs to be a clear place in the chart because that could obviously be a problem. It could be a breach either on our part or um, in terms of what the court wants the uh, family to know. So all of those sorts of things we really need to look at. We realize that if we have all that information and we're getting that on paper, then we don't have to talk about it while the child's there. Or what if the birth parents show up and we don't really want to talk about the case that's pending in front of this person that just left the judge. So um, there is that trauma-informed component to it that we're hoping by being more aggressive about creating this case management piece we're really hoping that we'll have um, better services and better two-way communication with the department. Because the other thing on the back end is that often kids don't stay in the same place. And we all know that. It's not uncommon for me to see a child during the emergency phase where they've just been placed with somebody, nobody knows the story, and then two weeks later they move to a permanent placement or a more permanent placement if no one notifies me that when they show up a few weeks later or we get a phone call from another foster parent that we don't know, it's, it's very confusing. All that needs to be documented in the chart. And I'm thinking if we have a person in our office that is really reaching out to the department and making all those connections, that's really going to be better service for everybody. And I understand, I think we all understand that the caseworkers have a lot going on. And calling my office is not at the top of their list. But we really want to beef, beef this up so that we have better two-way communication so that we know, I know in my office, everything that the caseworker knows. That's all I have. Let me know if you have any other ideas for how we can get better. Um, I think right now, from a financial perspective, we don't have any funding for this clinic. So right now, student um, staffing is the best we can do. And I think it's actually a really good experience for medical social work students because they aren't getting, they're getting some care management, but they're not getting as much as we'd like them to. So that when they do finish, they have a better idea of what foster care is, what the children's, what those children's needs are compared to the general population. All right.